start? Well, it's really good to be back. And I have to tell you, you guys are the smartest ladies in the whole world. Clark and I watched from Israel when you did the, the trivia game on Joshua. And he was, his heart was bleeding going, those questions are way too hard. Who came up with those questions? And then we had winners. And I'm like, see, they know their stuff. And, and they know what they're talking about. And you guys won prizes because you knew what you were talking about, huh? <laughs> I was blessed. I was so proud of you guys. Anyway, today we come to our study in uh, lesson 17 of Joshua chapter 22. And what we've seen so far is that God has said many times to Joshua, do not fear but be of good courage, for I will fight for you. And what we saw last week as we ended with Joshua 21, uh, verses 44 and 45, is that the Lord, in fact, gave them rest all around. Because why? He's Jehovah Shalom. He is our peace. He is our rest. And it also says that the Lord delivered all their enemies into their hand. Why? Because he is Jehovah Saboet. He is the God of angel armies. He's the Lord of hosts who fights on our behalf. And then in verse 45, it says, not a word failed of any good thing which the Lord had spoken to the house of Israel, but all came to pass. And I think that was my favorite part as it came to pass. Whatever we're going through, it's going to come to pass. Amen? Isn't that give you hope? I love that because we can all look back on the faithfulness of God at one time or another in our lives, and he did exactly what he said he would do, didn't he? Always faithful. And so that's a, a great encouragement, and I don't think there's a better one that we can have. Well, in Joshua 21, verses 1 through 4, we see that Joshua shows appreciation. He says, then, it says, then Joshua called the Reubenites, the Gadites, they're in the plains of Moab, and the half-tribe of Manasseh. Now remember, this is speaking of the two and a half tribes that are on the east side. They settled on the east side of the Jordan. They were the ones that God called to get up and bring all their fighting men and go help the rest of the tribes of Israel go in and conquer the land on the west side. Verse 2, so Joshua called and said to them, you have kept all the Mo that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you and have obeyed my voice in all that I commanded you. For all seven years they had been with Joshua, they were diligently obedient to help God's people conquer the enemy. And in verse 3 continues, you have not left your brethren these many days up to this day, and you have kept the charge of the commandment of the Lord your God. So even though they had their own inheritance, they were comfortable, they had their tents on the east side of the Jordan, they fought on behalf of their brethren. And if you, we could say it, it, it would have been really easy for them to say, well, this doesn't affect me. We've got our land. We've got our comfort. We've got our livestock. We've got our little homes. We're starting our families. Yeah, what they're going through, that's their deal. It doesn't affect me. How many times do we see that even in the body of Christ today? I remember when we started going through the battle out here in the wine country, we had many churches in the valley say, well, maybe you should just move. It doesn't affect us. What, what do you want us to do? But yet we're the body of Christ and we're to be there for one another. And I think that that is what this is. This really hit me as a picture of the body of Christ and how we are to operate with one another. Exactly as Paul instructs us to do in Philippians 2, 2 through 5, where he says, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for your own interests, but also for the interest of others. And he goes on to say, let this mind be in you, which is in Christ Jesus. If we have the mind of Christ, anything that affects my sister or brother in the body of Christ should affect me. Because not only do we weep with those who weep, but we are to rejoice with those who rejoice. God has interconnected us through his spirit. And so back in Joshua 22, 4, it says, And now the Lord, your God, has given you rest to your brethren, speaking of those nine and a half tribes on the west, as he promised them. 
Now, therefore, return and go to your tents to the land of your possession, which Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you on the other side of the Jordan. So finally, the land is conquered. We saw last time we were together, it's distributed with all the boundaries. And now they get to go back to their families and their land on the eastern side of the Jordan. Then in verses 5 and 6, Joshua gives an exhortation as well as a blessing. Now the exhortation is in verse 5, and it is to take careful or be diligent to heed, not only to hear, but also do the commandment and the law which Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you to love your God, which this always begins in the heart and it results in obedience and to walk or to make progress in, or in growing in all of his ways to keep or to obey his commandments, to hold fast to or to abide in him and to serve him with all of your heart and with all of your soul. So verse six, Joshua blessed them and sent them away and they went to their tents. And what a great exhortation for us today to take careful heed, to love God with all of our heart, with all of our mind and with all of our soul. In other words, making the love of God a priority in our lives. As Matthew 6, tells us that we are to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and then all these other things shall be added unto us. Unfortunately, we often hear the word obedience and our mind automatically goes to legalism. But this is not having anything to do with the law. It's about love. Because if we love someone, we will please them. I think of a marriage relationship. I can tell you in counseling to go home and clean your house and do your laundry and cook three meals a day and make sure the kitchen is clean after everyone and your husband's clothes are put away and the lawns are mowed or whatever. I can give you a list of things to do. But that's out of duty. It, it's not necessary if we truly love our husbands and we're putting him above our own. We will go home and do those things. We won't need to be told those things. So see, it's not about a law. It's about love and it's about responding. And that is what relationship is about, is response. You see, religion is legalism, but that's not what we're called to. We're called to that relationship. And that's what Joshua understood. The people could never receive God's blessings without a love response of obedience to what he had called them to do. And so therefore, he says, take careful heed, meaning beware and be on guard. In other words, stay elite, alert, and do not fall asleep spiritually. Do not forsake your first love, like the church at Ephesus, showing again that we have a choice to make. We have a part to play in our walk with God. Now, I'm sure that Joshua must have had the Shema in mind when he said these things back from Deuteronomy 6, 4, and 5, where it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. The word is echad, meaning that he's united, three in one. And you shall love the Lord your God. How? With all your heart, your mind, with all your soul. And I love this term, love the Lord with your soul. This speaks of with all every bit of appetite to hunger and thirst after the Lord and with all your strength. Just as recorded in Matthew 22, after Jesus had um, silenced the Sadducees, in verse 35, a lawyer asked him a question just to try to trip him up. And he said, teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? Speaking out of all 613 laws. And Jesus answered him in verse 37. He said, you, it's simple. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, your, all your soul, and with all your mind. He says, this is the first and the greatest commandment. So it's a vertical relationship that we are to love the Lord God with all of our heart, mind, and soul. But then the second commandment is like it. It said, then you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And it's speaking of the horizontal relationships. And it says, upon these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. What does that mean? Jesus loved us so much that he went to the cross 
so that we could first have that vertical relationship with them. And then secondly, we would have that, that horizontal relationship with one another. So as we love God first above all else, then everything else will flow from that as it's God who works in us both to will and to do according to his good pleasure. In fact, throughout the Bible, we're told to fear God, to walk in his ways, to obey him. Because if we don't, if we don't keep Jesus at our focus, if we don't love him supremely, the deception and depravity will eventually take over. You can read Romans 1. The book of Proverbs will contrast depravity from that who loves God and puts God, the way of the wicked with the way of the righteous. And I'm so glad that we don't have to guess what is pleasing to the Lord. In fact, Micah 6, 8 tells us that he has shown you, O man, what is good and what the Lord requires of you, but to do justly, to love mercy and walk humbly with your God. It's that simple to put Jesus first. Deuteronomy 5.33 says that you shall walk in all the ways which the Lord your God has commanded you so that you may live and it may be well with you and that you may prolong your days in the land which you shall possess. As we possess his blessings, it is dependent upon us just turning to him and allowing him to love us back. Well, in Joshua 22, 7 through 9, we see the armies of the two and a half tribes leave. Now, in verse 7, to the half tribe of Manasseh, Moses had given a position, possession in Bashan. But to the other half of it, Joshua gave a possession among their brethren on this side of the Jordan westward. And indeed, when Joshua had sent them away to their tents, he blessed them. And as I thought about this, I thought, these guys had been, they laid down their life for their brethren. They had been fighting side by side, completely dependent upon one another for the past seven years. Their life depended upon each other. And now Joshua is going to send them on their way. Don't you hate that? It made me think of Dave and Jen. Well, first of all, years ago, Dave left. And it's like, what are you doing? We've been in this battle of the Lord together. We've been serving together. You know, that's the interesting thing with the church is God brings people, he raises them up and he sends them out and he multiplies the ministry. It's a good thing. But in my flesh, I'm like, what are you doing? You never leave. You always stay. It's like that, uh, I don't even know where I came up. Why, why do you not love me? What is that? I don't know. There's some, why do you? Anyway, never mind, because who knows what I'm talking about, right? But I, I thought of Dave and Jen, where it's going to come a time where they're going to go back to the Philippines. And it's like, no, you have to stay here. I told her this morning, Halal was American made. She needs to stay. She's ours. But I don't think that's going to happen. It's just when you get uh, so connected with people that you're serving alongside, you depend upon each other, and then God stirs the pot a little bit. And I think it's a good thing because it keeps us reliant upon him. I love what John Corson always says. He says, you know what? God is uh, sending us out for our chores, but one day he'll bring us back together for supper. And I love that we have eternity to count with one another. We will always be together, connected through the Holy Spirit. And so anyway, that's what gets me through. I don't know about you. Anyway, verse eight, and he spoke to them saying, return with much riches to your tents. So their obedience and faithfulness is now going to be rewarded as God allows them to take the plunder back with them to their families. And it's described as very much livestock with silver, with gold, with bronze, with iron, and with very much clothing. And then he instructs them to divide the spoils of the enemies with the brethren. You'll remember back in Numbers 32 that they were all commanded to stay and fight until the battles were over. And now they're heading home with the blessing from their obedience. And I think this is great because it shows, again, that all battles will eventually come to an end. I love the phrase that says, this too shall pass. And I need to hold on to that. Sometimes I need to be reminded of that more than others. But this too shall pass. Whatever it is that you're going through, this too shall pass. And God will remain 
faithful because that's who he is. Now, while we're blessed most of the time, it is in spite of our actions. But Deuteronomy 28 says that if you obey, you will be blessed. Yet obedience is not a work of the flesh. It's not something I can muster up. It's a work of the spirit. It's not duty. It's love. According to Romans 1, 5, we know that God actually supplies enough grace for us to be obedient to all he calls us to do. In other words, it's God from start to finish. It's just a matter of us choosing and stepping in to that grace. Because I can't obey anyone in and of myself. I want to fight. I want my own way. I, my flesh demands my own way. But in the spirit, we're able to submit to what he wants. As we put our faith in Christ, that faith accesses his grace that enables it. And it's that kind of obedience that doesn't look for the blessing. The blessing is just a byproduct. So verse nine, the children of Reuben, the children of Gad and the half tribe of Manasseh returned and they departed from the children of Israel at Shiloh where the tabernacle had been kept for or was kept for 400 years which is in the land of Canaan, to go back to the country of Gilead, to the land of their possession, which was, again, on the eastern side of the Jordan, which they had obtained according to the word of the Lord by the hand of Moses. So, again, as they returned to their land on the eastern side, we saw that the boundaries were determined for each tribe. The bounty is divided, and the blessing of Joshua is going with them. And now in verse 10, they make an impressive altar. And when they came to the re region, verse 10, of the Jordan, which is in the land of Canaan, the children of Reuben, the children of Gad and half tribe of Manasseh built an altar there by the Jordan, a great, impressive altar. Now, this is significant not only because of its size, but also because the meaning in general of an altar. You see, an altar was typically where it would be a place of sacrifice, but not only for the children of Israel, but also for the pagans. So this could create a problem. With the nine and a half tribes in Canaan on the western side, these two and a half tribes on the eastern side of the Jordan no doubt thought they would be separated from the rest of the children of Israel forever. And so for convenience, rather than having to cross the Jordan and travel to Shiloh, Every time they wanted to worship, they figured, well, we'll just build our own altar. It reminds me of what the tribe of Dan did with Jeroboam, building the altar up in the city of Laish, where the children of Israel ended up falling into idolatry because he didn't want the people to go back to Jerusalem because he was afraid he would lose them to Rehoboam. It's another story for another time, but it kind of reminded me of this. It would seem that they had the right motive to try to help the people, and they were afraid that they didn't want to travel. But notice in verse 11, it says, Now the children of Israel heard someone say, Behold, the children of Reuben, the, half, the children of Gad and half-tribe of Manasseh, have built an altar on the frontier of the land of Canaan in the region of the Jordan on the, ch on the children of Israel's side. And because they assumed that this altar was an allegiance to the pagan gods, verse 12 says, when the children of Israel heard of it, the whole congregation of the children of Israel gathered together at Shiloh to go to war against them. Now, I thought this was really interesting because notice they were willing, they had fought right along their side for seven years, depended upon each other's lives. And because of something they hear, they're going to go to war with them. That's amazing. But again, what a picture of the body of Christ. How sad. And it was only because they assumed. And what a mistake. Unfortunately, it's more common than not. Proverbs 18, 17 tells us the first one to plead his case seems right until his neighbor comes and examines him. In other words, Wait to hear all the facts before you make judgment. The problem is, ultimately, there was no discussion. It was just a quick reaction to something that they had heard, to gossip. And they were going to gather and make war against their own brethren. And while on one hand their readiness to hold one another accountable is commendable, in verse 13 through 20, before they took action, they did go send men 
to get the other side of the story, which is always wisdom. So we see that they redeem themselves. They don't go to war. They were just ready to. And in verse 13, it says, Then the children of Israel sent Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the priest, to the children of Reuben, the children of Gad and half tribe of Manasseh, into the land of Gilead. And with them, ten rulers or princes, one ruler each from the chief house of every tribe of Israel, and one and each one was the head of his house of his father's father among the divisions of Israel. Then they came to the children of Reuben, Gad, and half tribe of Manasseh, to the land of Gilead, and they spoke with them, saying, Now it's clear they thought this altar represented competition with God's tabernacle in Shiloh, where God commanded them to sacrifice and worship. And they also thought that they would fall into idolatry. So in verse 16, Phineas brings this accusation, saying, Thus says the whole congregation of the Lord, what treachery is this that you have committed against the God of Israel to turn away this day from following the Lord in that you have built for yourselves an altar that you might rebel in the day against the Lord. And he goes on to use the first example because this was their history. And sometimes we, we plague people with their past, don't we? Well, they've done it in the past, so this must be what they're going to do again. But it was really unfair. But he, he cites the first example with the sin at Peor. When the men of Israel had committed adultery with the Moabite women and gave themselves to their idol worship of the Moabite gods, which brought God's judgment, you'll remember, and it, and it plagued killing 24,000 people. So verse 17, they asked, is the inquiry of Peor not enough for us from which you are not, we are not cleansed until this day? Although there was a plague in the congregation of the Lord, but that you must turn away this day from following the Lord? And it is, and it shall be, if you rebel against the Lord today, that tomorrow he will be angry with the whole congregation of Israel. Nevertheless, if the land your of your possession is unclean, then cross over to the land of possession of the Lord where the Lord's tabernacle stands. In other words, if the, the east side of the Jordan is so unclean, then come on over and join us and take possession among us. But do not rebel against the Lord, nor rebel against us by building yourself an altar besides the altar of the Lord our God. In other words, don't go off on your own. They're pleading the, the, the th two and a half tribes. Please don't commit a sin. Please don't do anything against God's word. Anybody, can you relate to that? They, pled, they were pleading with the other children of Israel. Why? Because they loved them. And they knew what the end would be. He said, they were saying, don't do what just seems right in your own eyes. You know, you've been walking with God. You've seen the victory. You've seen his faithfulness. Why would you turn? And the problem is they knew that they would pay the consequences as well. Because when one sins, many will, will fall. And that is what they were seeing then, and it is true today. And then he gives the second example of sin with Achan from Joshua 7, when they conquered Jericho, asking in verse 20, did, Achan the son, did not Achan, the son of Zerah, commit a trespass in the accursed thing, taking things that he was not supposed to take? And the result was that the wrath fell on or affected all the congregation of Israel. And that man did not perish alone in his iniquity. And that is the point. It's interesting to me how many people will say, it's my life, it's none of your business. And, and you think, oh, that's so not true. If you have children, if you have parents, if you have brothers and sisters, if you have good friends, if you're a part of the a body of Christ, it will affect everyone. And we see that over and over because when one person is disobedient, the entire body suffers. In 1 Corinthians 6, 19, we're told that we are not our own but we had been bought at, the, at a price. We have been purchased. We have been redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus. And instead of going to war immediately because of what they heard, they wisely sent men 
uh, the, the leaders of all the tribes to hear the explanation as to why they built this mighty altar, but not only to hear the explanation, but to plead with them not to turn from the living God. And then the eastern tribes respond in verse 21. It says, the children of Reuben, of Gad, and half-tribe of Manasseh answered and said to the heads of the division of Israel that the Lord God of gods, the Lord God of gods, he knows, I love this, he is omniscient, he knows everything, and let Israel itself know if it is in rebellion or if in treachery against the Lord, do not save us this day. If we have built ourselves an altar to turn from following the Lord or if to offer on it burnt offerings or grain offerings or if to offer peace offerings on it, then let the Lord himself require an account. In other words, God knows, let him be our judge. And what a great example for us today on one hand. Yes, we're to confront one another. We are to be humbly receptive when someone is trying to turn us back to the Lord. But if, we are, if our conscience is clear before the Lord, we need to stand firm and say, God knows, and he will be my judge. And I think that's a great example because ultimately what God knows and what God thinks is the most important thing. And man might have a misconception, but God doesn't because he knows every inch of our heart. And that's why Paul, I love 1 Corinthians 4.35, because Paul says, you know, I don't even judge myself because he realized he was a sinner. And he goes on in verse four and he says, my conscience is clear, but that doesn't make me innocent. That phrase is so important for us to understand. We might have a, a clear conscience, but it doesn't make us innocent. We all have, we all have sin because we are all sinners. It's the Lord who judges me, Paul went on to say. He says, therefore, judge nothing before the appointed time, but wait till the Lord comes. And he will bring to light what is hidden in darkness. And he will expose the motives of each man's hearts. And at that time, each will receive his praise from God. And I think this is so good and so important for us to understand because our motives can be misjudged and we can misjudge other people's motives. And I know that I am so guilty of being quick to rush to judgment on things that I constantly have to check myself. If we could just see things from other people's perspective, I think it would help us so much. It would help us to be able to have that heart of intercession for one another rather than judgmentalism. And I think it's an important lesson that we learned this week that other than loving God supremely, which is the first and foremost, we need to come to one another as a part of the body of Christ, especially when we hear things. Rather than accuse or come to a conclusion regarding others, just as Isaiah 118 says, Isaiah says, come now, let us reason together, thus says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured by the sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. So it is God who judges. Judge nothing before it's time when it's dealing with others in the body of Christ. And ultimately... These tribes on the east side of the River Jordan realized the concept that Paul would later write in Romans 14, 7 through 13, which is that none of us lives to himself and no one dies to himself. Verse 9, for to this end, Christ died and rose and lived again, that he might be the Lord of both the living and the dead. But why do you judge your brother? Or why do you show contempt for your brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And that's when every knee will bow and every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us shall give an account of himself to God. Therefore, let us not judge um, one another anymore. Now this is speaking of coming to a conclusion of judgment. We are not the judge. Yes, we are to judge one another according to the word of God. When God calls something sin, we can call it sin. But we are not to judge the motives and come to the conclusion of someone's heart. So he says, let us not judge, do that anymore, but rather resolve this, not to put a stumbling block or cause 
or a cause to fall in our brother's way, which is much more important. Back to Joshua 22. And we're going to see what motivated their decision to build this altar. But, verse 24, in fact, we had, have done it for fear. They humbly admit that they were fearful for a reason, saying, in time to come, your descendants may speak to our descendants, saying, what have you to do with the Lord God of Israel? For the Lord has made the Jordan a border between you and us. Your chil the, you children of Reuben and children of Gad, you have no part in the Lord. So, dis so your descendants would make our descendants cause or cease fearing the Lord. So it was due to a fear of being cut off from the rest of the children of Israel and that th so that they would have a place of worship. They feared what the future would hold. Now, this is in direct opposition to what they've been told over and over and over and in Joshua. Do not fear, do not be dismayed, for I, the Lord, will be with you, and I will never leave you. And they had forgotten the admonition of the Lord, and that caused fear. And therefore, verse 26, we said, let us now prepare to build ourselves an altar, not for burnt offerings nor for sacrifice, but that it may be a witness between you and us and our generations after us that we may perform the service of the Lord before him with our burnt offerings, with our sacrifices, and with our peace offerings that your descendants may not say to our descendants in time to come that you have no part in the Lord. Therefore, we said that it will be when they say this, to us, to our generations in time to come, that we, we may say, here is the replica of the altar of the Lord, which our fathers made, though not from burnt, for burnt offerings nor for sacrifices, but it is a witness between you and us. Far be it, verse 29, from us that we should rebel against the Lord and turn from following the Lord this day to build an altar for burnt offerings, for grain offerings, or for sacrifices. Besides, the altar of the Lord, our God, which is before his tabernacle, he, again at Shiloh. And so they humbly admit that, that it wasn't built out of rebellion, but rather fear. It wasn't for sacrifice or offerings to the pagan gods or even to God because that's what they needed to do at Shiloh. But it was to worship God Almighty. And Proverbs 15, 1 tells us that a soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. And the tongue of the wise uses knowledge rightly. And that's exactly what their answer does here. They humbly come in. They don't get defensive and say, we're not going to do that. You guys are wrong. You're crazy. No, they just said, you know, it was because we feared. And then they explained their heart. And so now they will dwell in the blessings of God with one another because of that. And in verse 30, it says, Now when Phinehas, the priest, and the rulers of the congregation, the heads of the division of Israel were with them, who were with them, heard the words that the children of Israel, uh, Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh spoke, it pleased them. Then Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the priest, said to the children of Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh, This day we perceive that the Lord is among us, because you have not committed this treachery against the Lord. Now you have delivered the children of Israel out of the hand of the Lord. And Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the priest, and the rulers, returned from children of Reuben, Gad, and, and the, from the land of Gilead on the east, to the land of Canaan on the west, to the children of Israel, and brought back word to them. So the thing pleased the children of Israel, and the children of Israel blessed God. And they spoke no more of going against them in battle to destroy the land where the children of Reuben and Gad dwelt. And the children of Reuben and the children of Gad called the altar witness, for it is a witness between us that the Lord is God. He is El Roe. God sees. He sees the depths of our hearts. He doesn't see man the way man sees man, but he looks upon the hearts and he knows everything. He knows our fears. He knows our confidences. He knows everything about us and we can entrust it to him as we humbly come before him. And so what we learn today is that as we love God, keeping our heart and our mind upon him and him primarily, we will be at peace knowing that the battles will pass and we will be gracious to one another because it's all about Jesus. 
in Psalm 133, it's why I love this, this psalm. It says, for behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It's like the precious oil upon the head running down on the beard, the beard of Aaron running down on the edge of his garment. It's like the dew of Hermon descending upon the mountains of Zion for there in the unity of the brethren, the Lord commanded blessings. You know, when the brethren dwell together in unity, there is blessings forevermore. There's life forevermore, the Bible says. So again, as we love God supremely and we dwell in unity, loving each other, we fulfill the heart of Jesus because that was his prayer in John 17, that we would dwell together in unity. In John 17, 21, he prayed to the Father for us he said that they may all be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us so that the world may believe that you sent me. There's a lot at stake for the body of Christ to dwell in unity and not go to war with one another. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for these great lessons that we got this week. Father, as um, we got through all the division and the boundaries of the land, Lord, we see that you have a plan and a purpose for it all. And Lord, whether our, our lot lies on the outskirts and we feel like it's hard to get to the, the center of, the, of God's people or maybe we're in the center, it doesn't matter. Geographical locations do not matter. Lord, our boundaries don't matter as long as we are found in Christ, as long as our focus is upon you, as long as we seek first the kingdom of God. We can trust that everything else will just fall into place because, God, you are the God who is sovereign over our lives, and you are a good, good Father. So, Lord, we thank you. We praise you. We thank you for the lessons today. And as we leave this place, I pray that we would just keep your face ever before ours. Lord, that we would not turn to the left or to the right, that we would not fear the unknown or the future, but God, we would just simply abide in your peace, staying under the spout where your grace comes out. We love you and we praise you and we give this day to you in Jesus' name. And God's ladies say, Amen. Let's stand together and we will dismiss with a song. I love you guys. It's so good to be back. It's good to see your smiling faces.